We are really excited to learn from John Powell this morning, but before we begin, we want to do a quick activity to ground us in our time together. So take a moment and look around. It's possible that you don't know many of the people in the room or that you are reuniting with old friends. We may have our differences and come from a variety of backgrounds, but there are still things beliefs, preferences, experiences, and desires that connect us to one another. This activity is simple. We are going to read a list of statements, and if the statement applies to you, simply stand up or raise your hand if you are able. Take a moment to look around you and acknowledge the group that you are connected with, and then just sit back down. So it's a little bit of a you know, Catholic thing. We're gonna get up, get down, that kind of thing. So stand up if you are a morning person. Whoa. I'd be sitting down. Excellent, thank you. You may sit down. Stand up if you have a costume picked out for Halloween. Nice. Creative people, yay. Thank you. Stand up if you work for a nonprofit. Good, what a good mix. Stand up if you volunteer for an organization that you're passionate about and that does not include your nonprofit. Thank you, John. <laughs> Excellent. So you're taking a look around when you stand up. Stand up if you've ever felt like an outsider. Thank you. Stand up if you feel seen in the workplace. Wow, that's very healthy of us. Okay, last one. Stand up if you want to create spaces of belonging. Good answer, good answer. Thank you. Belonging is a fundamental human need. Belonging is the top human capital issue employers are facing today. Belonging affects health and happiness, but also productivity, engagement, motivation, and retention. Belonging is good for business, and that's why we're here today. We've got a full agenda, and Pam Clark Reidenbach with the Northern Illinois Center for Nonprofit Excellence is here to get us pumped up for our keynote speaker, John Powell. Welcome, Pam. Belonging begins with us, Rockford. There's no better time than now to build a culture of belonging in our community where all people are seen, heard, and valued. As Mary mentioned, I am Pam Clark Reidenbach. I'm a member of the Belonging Task Force and Executive Director for the Northern Illinois Center for Nonprofit Excellence, more fondly known as NICNI. We're pleased to have you with us today and optimistic seeing your interest in building a culture of belonging in your workplace. We would not be here today without our sponsors, so please help me to thank Collins Aerospace, United Way of Rock River Valley, Rockford Public Schools, Rockford Park District, and the Rockford Chamber of Commerce. We're here because being an inclusive company or organization is both a moral and a business imperative. It sends a message to the world that you stand for equality for all and that business can and should be a force for good. Belonging makes for a better, stronger company that reflects and serves the community. The businesses highlighted today have committed to making necessary changes within their company. They see an opportunity to stand alongside employees and other industry leaders to work toward greater equality and a sense of belonging for everyone. They embrace core values that include celebrating individuality and diversity and treating all people with respect, dignity, and fairness. Evidence demonstrates that a culture of belonging helps companies attract and retain the best talent, creates great products and services, fosters creativity and innovation, and contributes to a more inclusive and just world. 
The Belonging Begins With Us Rockford initiative is led by a belonging task force made up of diverse individuals in the community who met online with Professor Powell for more than a year, strategizing how we can build a culture of belonging in our community. We landed on four focus areas. The first, personal relationships. Building bridges between diverse people and relationships that are meaningful and trust-filled. The second pillar is community life, where we develop connections between neighbors and taking responsibility for the well-being of each other. The third is co-creating systems and structures, working together to address issues and barriers within systems and structures so all people prosper and thrive. And fourth is opening doors, where we encourage broad engagement, promoting leadership opportunities and speaking up for equity and reform. To learn more, look for individuals from the task force with the belonging t-shirts. We will also share a website link at the end of today's session, providing resources, tools, and ways that you too can get involved. Professor Powell, the time spent with you was enlightening and inspiring. We are incredibly grateful for the time you shared with us, the friendship we've established, and so very pleased to have you here in our community. We look forward with great anticipation to your message to learn your research and experience with the critical role that employers play in building a community culture of belonging. We are proud to showcase our extraordinary community and share with you and the audience all that has transpired through the journey of our four local businesses. And we hope that you, local employers here today, come away with ways that you too can be a part of this movement. We are deeply fortunate to have the full buy-in from the mayor of the city of Rockford. His extraordinary leadership is an example of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging that is unprecedented and evident in multiple areas. Thank you, Mayor McNamara, for embracing this work. We also appreciate our partnership for this event with the Chamber of Commerce and their encouragement of the business community to step up and speak out in support of belonging in their workplace. So please welcome Caitlin Pusateri, President of the Rockford Chamber of Commerce, who would like to share a few words. Good morning. Thank you, Pam. Thank you all so much for being here. My name is Caitlin Pusateri. I'm the president of the Rockford Chamber of Commerce. Our organization is just about a thousand members uh, from across the region. Our members are actually from five different states and represent about 61,000 employees. That is a lot of people who could feel like they belong. So we at the Chamber really believe in this work and we are so excited to take things back and start uh, implementing it in our own organization and then spreading the word uh, to all of our members in the business community at large. Our mission is to lead business growth and we know that we can't do that without a healthy community where everybody feels that they belong, that they're able to engage, that they're represented, that they have access to what they need. So this is really important work that really grows your business and that's, that's really exciting for us. So thank you for inviting us to the table. We are very excited to be here. It is my pleasure to introduce Mayor Tom McNamara. He is going to share some good work that the city is doing in this arena. And what I love about our mayor is just how honest and transparent he is and how willing he is to come to the table and just be his own unique self and invite others to do the same. Thank you, Caitlin. Just really excited to be here with all of you today. I want to say, just uh, to begin with, a huge thank you to Pam Clark Reidenbach, the entire Belonging team, to not just put this event on, but really bring a true sense of belonging to our community and to push us all forward. I want to also say a sincere thank you to the Rockford Park District for hosting this event here at this beautiful facility. As I said, I am really excited and honored to be with all of you today. Uh, I think we all have this fundamental need to belong. We want to feel that we're part of a group and that what makes us unique is really truly valued and makes our group stronger. At the City of Rockford, we have started, and I underline the word started, our journey to create a culture of belonging. 
Since I know you're all anxious to hear from our amazing keynote speaker, I'll just provide just a couple of examples of the work we're starting to do at the City of Rockford. So first, we have voluntarily participated in the Human Rights Campaign's annual Municipal Equality Index. The MEI, as they call it, examines the laws, policies, and services of municipalities and rates them on their basis of inclusivity of our LGBTQI plus residents who live and work inside the city of Rockford. Since 2018, and what I'll say is in, at the end of 2017, they rank you from zero to 100. In 2017, we had a rank of 59. If we have any teachers in the audience, that's obviously a clearly failing grade. Today, our rank is a 92. And I am sincerely hopeful that at the end of this year, when they come out with their new scores, will be a perfect 100. But to do this work took a lot of effort. So to improve our rating, we've adopted a non-discrimination ordinance for our, all of our city contractors. We've included transgender inclusive healthcare benefits in our health care plan. We've established a community relations commission to address issues of equality, equity, and discrimination. We've proclaimed the month of June to be LGBTQ Pride Month. We've appointed employees to serve as our LGBTQIA plus liaisons for both the city of Rockford as well as our police department. And we've been more widely distributing all of the information about city of Rockford job openings and postings. The second thing we have done, we've created employee resource groups. Hard to believe that our own City of Rockford organization did not have these before, but now today we are really proud of the work that our women's group, our Allies for African American Employees group, and our LGBTQI plus group, as well as our SOMOS group has done. These are voluntary employee-led teams that aim to foster a diverse and inclusive workplace. Third, all of our employees are participating in DEIB training. All of our employees have to complete an organizational-wide survey. And I think what makes me really excited about the work that we are doing with Ignite Change Solutions and Rebecca Francis is that we are actually tracking the metrics to ensure that we become a more inclusive organization. And finally, I just want to highlight something I'm personally proud of. I've had this opportunity as mayor to appoint individuals who call Rockford home to different boards and commissions. And when I first got elected, it was very obvious when you looked at our boards and commissions, we were really strong in a category, white older men. That was somewhat funny, you guys should have laughed. <laughs> um, but today, I'm really proud. We've increased the number of appointments by more than 80% for women. We've increased the number of appointments for minorities by more than 60%. I'm excited, and I believe this is... Our diversity in the city of Rockford makes us stronger, but if they're not at the table on important boards and commissions, we're losing a tremendous opportunity. And so we need these boards and commissions to be more reflective of the citizens that they serve. And I am the first to tell you, with the work that we have done, we have a long way to go. There's no cheerleading and cheers going on at the city. We have a lot more work to do, and it's going to be something that's embedded in our everyday work. So these are just a couple of the examples that we have, but I think we're all really excited right now to hear from our keynote speaker, John A. Powell. He's the director of Othering and Belonging at the University of California, Berkeley, a research institute bringing people together to identify and eliminate the barriers to inclusive, just, and sustainable society and to create transformative change toward a more equitable world. That's the job I want one day. John is well known for his work on target universalism and othering and belonging, and is the author of several books, including his most recent work, Racing to Justice, transforming our concepts of self and other to build an inclusive society. Please join me and give him a really big Rockford welcome. Please, John Powell.
Good morning. Good morning. All right, great. It's great to be here. My only regret, well, two maybe, it's a little cold. <laughs> uh, but the other one is that I have to leave so soon. I have another uh, speaking engagement tomorrow, I'm speaking to a bunch of investors in California. But I couldn't be happier to be here with you and the capstone for some of the work you've been doing, especially I feel like uh, Pamela and I are old friends, even though this is the first time we met in person. And I know that this is hard work, and I have a PowerPoint, uh, which I may not get through, but I'll give it to you. The point is not to show you a PowerPoint, but really to engage with you and share with you some ideas. And a friend of mine, Manuel Pastor, says, to have a PowerPoint, you only need two things, power and a point. So I hope I have at least one of those things. Who belongs? within the circle of human concern. In a democracy, belonging is the most important endowment we share with one another. Only those who fully belong may select who belongs, may participate to define the rights of members and which needs must be met by the community. This happens in public space, which is a space of collective action, government activity, and open places where everyone is welcome, such as parks, libraries, and roads, or the marketplace of ideas. It also includes public services, such as the police and fire departments, schools and universities. On the other hand, we live much of our lives within private spaces, where we enjoy protections from government interference and surveillance. Private space, including our homes, places of worship, is a space of personal liberty, retreat, and personal conscience. But the distinction between public and private masks meaningful differences between private actors in our society. Corporations have smuggled themselves into the private sphere and claim the same rights as ordinary people, such as freedom of speech, lobbying, and campaign contributions. By clothing themselves within private space, they concentrate wealth and influence in ways that distort our democracy and harm our environment. They argue that any laws or regulations to help people and to curb their behavior also threaten small businesses, private citizens, and individual liberty. Corporate space should not be mistaken for private space. Misaligned corporate space threatens both public and private space. Within this space, corporations gather and manipulate information about us and limit our ability to organize and control them. As the corporate sphere expands, private space shrinks, public space is diminished, and real people are pushed outside the circle of human concern. When this happens, people fall into a four sphere, non-public, non-private space where the most marginal in our society live, people who enjoy neither the rights of public space nor the benefits of private space. Historically, women and slaves were denied access to public rights. They couldn't vote, run for office, serve on juries, or in many cases, own property. Nor did they have the private space to retreat to, free from surveillance or harassment. Before the American with Disabilities Act, people with disabilities also had limited access to public space and private space. Today, this non-public, non-private space includes undocumented immigrants, ex-offenders, the homeless, and extremely poor, and many more. These people not only lack access to public or private space, but too often we don't see them as part of we the people, as inside our circle of human concern. We see them as the other, those who do not belong, even as we insist corporations are people who do belong. In our society, we often discuss two spheres, public and private, while in fact there are four, public, private, non-public, non-private, and corporate. We must insist that people, all people, belong inside the circle of human concern, not corporations. So, Sabawadu. A Zulu word, and it means I see you. But to say I see you is too thin. One interpretation means that I see you and your family and those who came before you. Another interpretation is the divine in me or the God in me sees the God in you. What we need to belong is to be seen, for someone to see us. We're literally born connected to another human being. Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which he argues that you have to first satisfy those basic needs to get to the next need. He says, physical safety, 
food, then belonging. His students have actually changed that and said, actually, belonging comes first. You don't get physical safety or food unless you belong. So it's really just a basic human need. And we're the Othering and Belonging Institute. We started off as the Haas Institute for a Fair and Inclusive Society. So we moved from inclusive to belonging. And one of the profound shifts from inclusive to belonging is the notion of co-creation. That sometimes when you're included in something, you're included in somebody else's thing. You're a guest. And sometimes your guest status can be revoked. You go to a party and you didn't dress right. It's like, well, you know, you can come back next week after you go to the cleaners. Or great party, but it's my party, my food, my friends, my music. Enjoy yourself, but then leave. So as a guest, you don't have full membership. You don't get to co-create. So inclusion, the way it's practiced in most industries, in most places, is one of being a guest. Belonging requires moving from being a guest to being a full member and co-creating. In some ways, this sort of move from equality to equity, then inclusion and belonging, is a long journey. The very concept of equality actually embraces the idea of belonging. And it basically says you get to co-create the world you live in. It's a radical expression of democracy. When Mary asked us to stand, if we had certain experiences, all of us essentially stood up. I think there were three people remaining seated when she said, have you ever been othered? Have you ever felt like you didn't belong? So we have these experiences of not belonging, but sometimes those experiences are institutionalized. It's not just not being invited to a party. It's not just being in the wrong place at the wrong time. It's basically saying, this place is not yours. And when that happens, it means we don't have an effective voice. We don't have representation. We don't have recognition. And we lack power. So those are all indices of not belonging. When you think of certain communities, one of the things they almost always speak about are one of these things. We're not represented. We don't have a voice. We don't have any power. And so belonging suggests that everybody, but everybody belongs. A concept of belonging by othering. Sometimes we create a group by denying another group. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the circle of human concern where all people, but all people, belong. And every group has blind spots. One of the strengths of belonging, especially as employers, is that if you can bring people together who have diverse experiences, who have diverse cultures, you actually cover each other's blind spots. Uh, but there's a trick to doing that. When people come together from diverse backgrounds, and have a common mission, that's the magic. When people come from diverse ground and each one of them have their own mission, that's a hot mess. And so you really want to align mission. You want to make sure that in terms of values, we all basically agree. Now what we may not agree on is the best way to get there. What we may not all agree on is what's causing us to fall short. That's okay. In that discussion, in those disagreements, in that diversity is where the magic really happens. Part of this is working off of Putnam's work from the book Bowling Alone. And he talks about a society that works well has to have a number of things. One of them is social capital, which basically means trust for each other, the ability to actually engage with people who are different than you. There are a couple of themes, a couple of stories that help us do this or prevent us from doing this. One of them is called breaking. Breaking is when you see someone who's different than you and you have a story about them, and it's a bad story. They're different. But we're not just saying that descriptively, we're saying we can't trust them. We're saying they're kind of still our job, they're changing our culture, they eat the wrong food. In some way, they're a threat. And so that's a breaking story. It's a story which puts the other, the apparent other, in a negative situation. And those stories matter. And those stories happen on the job, happen in the newspapers, happen on the radio. Uh, oftentimes, people we actually don't see, but we hear stories about. That's called breaking. The opposite of breaking is bridging. Bridging is when you connect with people who are apparently different, and you're willing to listen to them. You're willing to listen with compassion. Doesn't mean you agree with them, but you're at least willing to give them a voice. And compassion means 
to suffer with. So I'm willing to acknowledge that even though I don't quite understand you, that you suffer, that you have a point of view, that it may not be my point of view. And those bridging stories really work magic. And part of the magic is co-creation. So as we move from breaking, as we move from living in our discrete lives, going to our discrete religious institutions, to actually listening to each other, we co-create something that wasn't there before. We create something new. So listening, engaging, organizing, and love all play a role in terms of belonging. And Dr. King said, justice is the public face of love. How we treat each other in public is an expression of love. And I was very impressed with your mayor. We actually have a mayor election happening in the Bay Area. Mayor, if you're not too busy, maybe you could come out and help us out. It's not enough to actually express the concept of belonging. It's important to actually measure it and to implement it. And so when the mayor talked about the equality index that you use for LGBTQ+, it's important to have some way of knowing if, in fact, you're moving in the right direction. And so there are a lot of things, especially as employers and people who run institutions, it's important to create a culture, but it's also important to create a practice and then to be able to measure it. We've developed something called the Inclusive Index, and you can go online and see it, and it's global. We look at about 200 countries, but then we break it down in terms of states. What are you doing to affirmatively say that people are included? And including is on the way to belonging. And you can see that Illinois ranked 14th in terms of the Inclusive Index. Unfortunately, we didn't have data broken down by city, so we can't say where Rockford is. But that's pretty good. You could be better, but it's pretty good. When we look at the United States globally, I think the United States is ranked in the 70th, like 75th, which is not so good. So what do we need to do to actually create a space where people actually belong? Again, there's a difference between inclusion and belonging. And there's a difference between equity and target universalism. What I want to suggest to you is that it's important to actually move from equity to target universalism. So if we look at the history of humankind over the last couple of thousand years, or even the last several hundred years, we find that going back three, four, five hundred years ago, the whole world was organized around hierarchy. There were kings and queens and dukes. There were pharaohs. And the assumption was that most people's lives really didn't matter. That those who were really at the top of the heap and everybody else just didn't matter. And that was for most of our modern history. And then about 200, 250 years ago, something happened. Two countries start affirmatively moving away from the assumption that some people matter and some people don't to the concept of equality. And those two countries were France and the United States. It's kind of amazing. It's only 250 years ago that we affirmatively embraced the notion of equality. Thomas Jefferson, having spent time in France as ambassador, grabbed the concept of equality and brought it back to the United States and stuck it into the Declaration of Independence, where he said, we hold certain truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, endowed with certain rights, endowed by God with certain rights. Now, Jefferson's concept of equality was limited. When he said men, he actually meant men. So some people take that and say, well, Jefferson was a hypocrite. He didn't include women. He had 600 slaves. Having said that, I don't think Jefferson was a hypocrite at all. He actually was introducing a concept that was in its infancy. It hadn't been developed. It had to be flushed out. And it was flushed out. We go 60, 70 years down the road in terms of our history, and Lincoln redefined equality. And he made it equality meaning something for everybody. And it wasn't just an idea. Out of that came the 14th Amendment, which actually, sometimes we talk about the Equal Protection Clause, which literally comes out of the 14th Amendment and extended the concept of equality to be much more robust. And I could say more, but I won't, except to say that the concept of equality has been around for a long time, not just from the Enlightenment in Europe, but actually 
throughout human history, but it only took root 250 years ago, and then in Lincoln, a little over 150 years ago, actually enshrined it even more, and it's up to us to take it to the next level. Well, what's the next level? Well, we go from equality to equity. What do we mean by equity? Why do we need to move from equality to equity? I'm a professor, so I hope you will excuse me if, if I profess. Uh, but the Western concept of equality comes from Aristotle. And Aristotle, when he talked about equality, said a number of things. He said, fairness and justice requires when people are situated the same, you treat them the same. Fairness and justice requires when people are situated the same, you treat them the same. But he went on to say, fairness and justice requires when people are situated differently, you treat them differently. Fairness and justice requires that when people are situated differently, you treat them differently. So what Aristotle is saying, does a professor at Berkeley that has rephrased Aristotle's words, and I call it targeted universalism. What targeted universalism says is that fairness and justice requires when people are situated differently, you treat them differently. So for much of our history, as we grapple with equality, we took the first part of Aristotle's message, that is treat everybody the same. That's not what Aristotle said. He said, only if people are situated the same do you treat them the same. So if someone is in a wheelchair, what they need in terms of getting up and down flights of stairs is different than someone who is ambulatory. You don't treat them the same because they're situated differently. And what we know now is that structures actually treat people differently. I just flew here from California. If you think about luggage racks on planes, a luggage rack treats people differently. There's a group of people who tend to be shorter than other people. That same group of people tend to have less upper body strength. And so you see this group of people on planes struggling to lift these, their luggage up over their head and put it in luggage racks. Who are these strange short people with not a lot of upper body strength? We sometimes refer to them as women. <laughs> so the very structure of the plane disadvantaged women. So what do women do? Because most women have figured this out. What women do, oftentimes when they fly, and rumor has it that this same group of short people with less upper body strength carry more luggage. <laughs> that doesn't seem to be a solution. So what they do is they check their luggage. That's an individual intervention for a structural problem. Now, if you check your luggage, you know you have to get to the airport 45 minutes to an hour earlier than if you don't check your luggage. And then when you arrive where you're going, you have to wait 45 minutes to an hour to find out your luggage didn't make it. Why I'm sharing this with you is to say individual solution to structural problems actually create a tax on the person trying to solve the problem. If we leave the structure in place and not notice the work that the structure is doing, then the individual pays a tax. And not only that, we actually then tell a story. We tell a story about why women are, need extra time. What's wrong with them? What's wrong with women? Besides being short and not having a lot of upper body strength. So we tell stories to explain this difference. What Aristotle says, people are situated differently. So how would you treat women fair and just based on Aristotle? You would accommodate, you would create a structure that acknowledge that they are situated differently. And it's not because they're special, it's because they're situated differently. So the situatedness matters a lot. So here we have, again, people situated differently. So part of that is noticing both how people are situated and the work that structures are doing. So as employers and people who run organizations, your job is to actually create a container where people are treated just and fair. And part of that you can't do by yourself. Part of that requires that you co-create 
part of that requires that you listen. Because most of us, being someone who's 6'3", I didn't notice how high those luggage racks were until I became a researcher. I had flown before, but I just hadn't noticed. I hadn't noticed occasionally women and a few short men struggling to get things over their head, but I didn't think about it systematically. I just thought, there's a person struggling. And oftentimes, if I wasn't too sleepy or tired, I'd say, can I help you? Sometimes I'd just watch them. Uh, I'm ashamed to say. <laughs> and now when I see them, I feel like saying, you know what, I do research on why you can't lift that thing above your head. <laughs> Which is sort of irrelevant. And I've literally said to many of my women friends, could we design a plane that didn't disadvantage women and their luggage? And most of them say, no, I can't imagine something different. That's just the way it is. And so part of your role as leaders, as employers, as people who are promoting belonging, is to help people imagine a world, a place, a situation where everyone belongs. But it's not just to imagine it. You don't do this by yourself. You do it in concert with others. You can suggest it. You can create a container. But it's not just enough to have a conversation about it. It's not just enough to have a committee. It's then to say, what do we have to do with our structures, with our systems, to make them work? And you're doing that. But that's not enough either. Then you have to do what the mayor said. How do we measure it? How do we know we're moving in the right direction? And when you do all that, you start building belonging. And notice, now you're not doing it by yourself. You're doing it with others. You're saying, I notice that you're struggling with your luggage. When you think about it, women may have participated in designing that plane. It's not saying that plane was designed by evil, bad men who hate women. That escalator may have been designed by someone in a wheelchair. It's not saying people who designed that escalator were hostile to people in, with disabilities. So when we design these structures, sometimes it's intentional. Came in last night with a wonderful driver, and they showed us a little bit of Rockford, and they talked about redlining that had existed in here, that design your neighborhoods, that design one side of the river as opposed to the other side of the river. They talked about where you locate your hospitals, and the place of the hospital makes it physically more accessible than other places. So sometimes those designs are intentional, but oftentimes they're not. To some extent, just some, not all, it's irrelevant. What you really are doing are looking at what the structures and culture are doing. So you have to collect data to notice that some people are systematically being excluded. So this is just some data on boys. Ross Chetty, which some of you may know, he's considered probably the most famous demographer in the United States today. He teaches at Stanford and Harvard. He's also a friend of mine. He just published a new study and I've been asked to comment on it. He looks at 22 billion interactions between people to see if that affects their life outcomes. That's interesting, 22 billion interactions between people. And my first question was not, what's the outcome? It's like, where'd you get that data? You know where you got it from? Social media. Okay, where is social media? Facebook, that's it. He got the data from Facebook. So they have data on all of our social interaction. See, not the government, not the police, you go to the private sector. But anyway, he got the data. And what he finds is that people's interaction, when you engage with people of a different socioeconomic status, the impact of that in terms of social mobility is extremely positive. That is, if you're only hanging out with people at your level, it sort of keeps you at your level. If you're hanging out with people cross levels, vertical, it actually has an impact in terms of moving people forward. So some of this data in terms of why black boys are less likely to do well as than white boys is that they're segregated economically and racially. In terms of promoting those positive outcomes, what I'm suggesting is not you just respond to removing barriers, not just you respond to removing bias, which you can't completely do, but you organize structures and cultures to produce the outcome you want. You affirmatively design structures to produce the outcome that you want. And how do you know you're succeeding? Because the outcome changes. You measure it by the outcome. 
part of it in your workplace, in other places, you create a space where everyone is heard. And not just where everyone is heard, where they have the capacity to speak. I worked with the community after the hurricane, Katrina, in New Orleans. And they brought together the community. But the community simply did not have the capacity to fully participate. They didn't have the data, they didn't have the researchers, they were at the meetings. But their ability to really participate was extremely limited. So how do you actually make sure that people are not just heard in terms of the voice, but they actually have the capacity, the data, the resources they need to fully participate? Some change will be transactional. That is, how do you get the right people in structures that already exist? Some change will be transformational, where you're actually changing the structures themselves. We've talked about the need to measure belonging. What are the metrics you're going to use? And there's a growing number of metrics now that people are using that is quite interesting. I'm meeting later today with Collins, and I'm looking at the data that they're developing. It's quite impressive. So these are some of the groups that are already involved in belonging and measuring data. Welcome America. They've moved away from welcome to belonging. And the reason they've done that is welcome creates hierarchy. I welcome you into my house. But no, this is my house. It will never be your house. How do we make it so that it's our house? Not my house, not your house, but our house. Belonging, does that work? We're doing a lot of work with Google. Google has a whole portal now on belonging. And they have 200,000 employees. And they reach out to the employees to figure out what it means, not just for the management, Sindar, who's head of Google, but what it means at every level. They also are addressing the needs of people around the world. Belonging is different than addressing one particular problem. So it's not just race, it's not just gender, it's not just sexual orientation. It says everything. What do we need to all belong? So we're not just trying to fix the problem for one group, even though we may need to focus on that group because of targeted universalism, but we're actually thinking about all groups. How do we make sure that everybody can fully belong? And it's not, again, just an idea or concept. How do we actually make sure our structure and culture actually is supportive of that? And again, using data for that. So Google is actually doing some of that. We're really delighted to work with you here in Rockford. But there are groups around the country that are working as well in Massachusetts, in Nebraska, in places that you wouldn't expect that's working on trying to become belonging cities or belonging communities. Here are some of the corporate sector that's decided that they're going to take their company and make it a belonging company. So there's a whole industry now, and relatively new, around belonging. And it's not just a new buzzword. It has a different meaning than inclusion. And it has a different meaning than equity. This is Darren Walker. He says, generosity is not enough. Giving resources is not enough. So what is enough? What's enough is a practice, an acknowledgment, an intention where everyone belong, and to be explicit about that, and then to work for that to happen. So I'm not doing this to help you. I'm doing this to help us. I'm doing this to define a new we. We the people. Our constitution starts off, we the people. But that we, as Jefferson indicated, was a small we. Most people were not included in that we. And many of those people who are excluded at the very beginning are still struggling to be fully included. Not as a guest, not to be welcome, but to be a full member to co-create. So this is the journey that you're on. And without being hyperbolic, I want to suggest that this is a journey that's not just for you here in Rockford. This is a journey not even just for Americans. It's a journey for the world. Can we create space where everyone belongs? And there's really powerful literature that suggests that when we do that, are we better off individually and collectively, but are we more productive? We don't have turnover at work. We are more innovative. But we have to do it right. And we'll make some mistakes on the way. If we can do it with generosity, and at the same time, uh, learning from each other, uh, we can do something quite powerful. So I want to, again, thank you for being on this journey and helping to make a world where everyone belongs and no one is other. Thank you. Hi, I'm Stephen Daniel from uh, Collins Aerospace. We showed in terms of like inclusiveness and belonging, you kind of 
illustrated as like a moat where you have either people on the outside or inclusiveness people on the inside or belonging with everybody kind of all mixed in with that mode. And I'm kind of curious what your perspective is on that with individual groups. Right, that's an important question. If a, one of my favorite current books is called in the, name, in the Name of Identity, Belonging and Violence. And the author is from the Middle East and he talks about having grown up partially in the Middle East, partially in Europe, that in order to belong, you had to basically hate another group. Your membership was predicated on othering somebody. Now, what you describe is not necessarily quite as pernicious as that. People can create groups, and those groups can be relatively exclusive. So there's a concept I didn't introduce. I'll just name it to you for you now. It's called bonding. So we talked about bridging, connecting, breaking, where you aggressively deny another group. And bonding is where you actually like your group without denigrating another group. So families may be like that. You know, I say I have a really cool family, which is true. I mean, but really cool. Uh, <laughs> and I'm not saying anything about your family. I doubt that your family is as cool as mine, but I'm not sure, you know. So that's bonding. So you can't have a situation where groups come together and they care about each other and they're not denigrating others. Bonding can easily slip into breaking, where it's not just that I'm liking my family, it's just where I'm putting down your family. One of the places that we come together, we live in a very segregated society. One of the places we come together is the workplace. We haven't quite figured out how to do it in terms of schools. We haven't figured out how to do it in terms of housing. We certainly haven't figured out how to do it in our religious or spiritual worshiping. So one of the few places we come together is the workplace. And because we're not practiced at being together, we sort of default to who am I comfortable with? And it's problematic. We go to some event, there are a bunch of us, and we get on a bus coming back from the event, and there's a woman at the back of the bus in a wheelchair. And everybody is moving to the front of the bus and looking at their cell phones. And she finally says, you know, I can see you. <laughs> uh, everybody was nervous. It's like, how do you talk to someone who we haven't practiced? So prior to bridging, learning to actually connect to people who are apparently different, uh, is just practice. And your role as a leader is not to allow us to default to our lowest common denominator. You're trying to build something. You're trying to build a team. You're trying to build a product. You're trying to build a mission. And what this effort is saying, let's go beyond that. I teach at a university. We bring students together where they deliberately bridge where they would not necessarily, where the Arabs or where the Palestinian students and Jewish students might not naturally come together. The restaurants in, in Israel, where if you go, go into the restaurant with someone from the other group, you get a discount. So we have to create, change the incentive structure because yes, it's gonna be awkward initially. And sometimes that awkwardness starts to break down. There was a time that when you see a white person and a black person, it's like, what's up with that? You immediately start asking questions, right? That's starting to certainly shift in California. People don't even highly notice it anymore. So part of it is talking about something different. And to your point, it's not just natural. These things were inscribed. So when we talked about redlining, I don't know how many of you have seen the movie Loving, but if you want a feel-good movie that's true, it's a story about the Loving family, interracial couple that married, that was arrested, that was put in jail because they were an interracial couple, and they had to flee the state and the case went all the way to the Supreme Court. At the time, 17 states had a law prohibiting interracial marriage. More recently, we had laws prohibiting homosexual marriages. So once those things are in place, they look natural. So in terms of you as leaders, you need to be affirmative in terms of creating a space where people belong. Nudge people, create incentives. And then there are things that people naturally come together. I taught for 10 years at the Ohio State University, and the D is very important. Uh, on any given Saturday, you see 103,000 people of different races, ethnicity, religions, all yelling for these 18 and 19 year old boys running up and down the field. And they become a team. It's like, go Buckeyes, go Buckeyes. Everybody's a Buckeye. You know, so we can create space where people experience each other and experience some connectivities. So I'll just end by just saying, there's no natural other. 
and there's no natural group. They feel natural once they're in place. People would say, why are white people and black people segregated? One explanation is that people just like to hang out with their own. And the obvious question is, how did that person become my own? Can I trade that person in for somebody else? So it's not natural. Once it's in place, it feels natural. But you as leaders have to have a vision beyond what we're doing now, because what we're doing now is not really working. Um, my name is Michelle. I'm not affiliated with any organization right now. I'm on disability. But I had a question. You were saying how some of the structures are even made by people that are marginalized and they don't realize it, the escalator and stuff like that. So how do you get people that are marginalized or are in different situations to see themselves different than just the other? I suggested that even people who are marginalized can actually participate in creating structures that continue to marginalize them. And we all do that. We know we, we engage in practices. When Hillary Clinton was running for president, and whether you liked her or not, we were talking to some people, and including women. 20% of the country at the time felt that no woman, not just Hillary, but any woman, should be president of the United States, including a good number of women. So they embraced the same ideology that women's place is not to be head of a country. I was at The Ohio State, and we had a chancellor who was a woman. The head of Victoria's Secret was one of the few billionaires in Columbus, Ohio. He was a major donor, and he believed that women should not be head of a big university. So he didn't give money. And a lot of women said, she can't raise money, they should get rid of her. Whether you liked her or not, it put her in a situation where she couldn't succeed, and she didn't get support from women. We live and breathe much of the same air. And so uh, it takes someone who's a visionary to see a new possibility. And it comes from many different places. When I was getting ready to go to college, my grandfather warned me about going to the college that I went to because there were so many white people. I went to Stanford. And I remember him saying to me, his advice was, don't do it. <laughs> He said, I remember to this day, and he said, you know, I love my grandfather, right? He's like, he said, you better leave those white people alone. He's from Mississippi, and that was his experience, is that you stay away from white people. You exist and accept your place as subservient to them. And the idea that you would challenge them or see yourself as a peer to him, he died thinking that you don't do that. It's too dangerous. So there will have to be leadership, people demonstrating something else people demonstrating that there's a different way, there's a different possibility, and it will have to come from different places. It's complicated, but yes, marginalized people oftentimes participate in their marginality. We stay in the segregated neighborhood because here's where we're safe. You know, we're safe, but we're necessarily cut off from resources, cut off from those interactions. I talked about bridging, and a friend of mine who died recently named Bell Hooks, she said, bridges are made to walk on. And by that, she meant that if you bridge with someone outside your group, you're going to be attacked both by the receiving group and your group. Why are you relating to those people? Why don't you stay in your place? I think it's Maya Angelou who says, you don't belong anywhere. You belong everywhere. You belong everywhere. I was just in Germany, and the Syrians there, Syrian refugees, are struggling. And they've been there for 10 years. And the Ukrainians are coming in now, and they're going to the front of the line in terms of getting housing and resources. And the Syrians are feeling really like they don't belong. They are invisible. They've been there 10 years, and they still have not gotten those resources. Literally, some of them have not unpacked their bags for 10 years. They know they're not going back to Syria, but they don't feel like they belong in Germany. And I don't know if this was helpful or not, but I said, you don't need permission from someone to belong. Your belonging is your birthright. You need to claim it. Uh, and I would say that to all marginalized people, but also at any given time, any group can be marginalized, including white men. So how do we say and embrace that everybody belongs, but make that a project not just for my group. I don't know who my group is. Maybe older black men who are tall with a limp. Is that at my group? Or maybe it's uh, people who used to go to Stanford. There's no natural group. 
The charge to create a world where everyone belongs is a charge for you to reach beyond the group you think of as your group, to reach beyond somebody who you naturally hang out with. More tricky for groups who are marginalized. But I would say claim it. Claim it not just for yourself, but literally for everyone. I'm Harlan Johnson with an organization called Come Together Rockford. I'm sure you're familiar with Walter Wink and Marshall Rosenberg. Any comments you have about those? The work around uh, what I call deep listening or empathetic listening is very similar to Rosenberg's thing in terms of nonviolent communication. And the notion is that we need to challenge hierarchies and dominance. I certainly agree. That's a big challenge. And where do we start? We start from where we are. You know, the, the world is full of problems and it can be overwhelming. And so we can just, that can sort of overwhelm us and create a kind of cynicism. But we start from wherever we are. And I have this thing where I say, in terms of bridges, sometimes, sometimes people say, literally when I was in Europe, how do you bridge with Putin? How do you bridge with someone who's dropping bombs on you? How do you bridge with a police officer who's killing people in your community? How do Trump supporters and Bernie supporters bridge? So you look at these really difficult situations. And there was an evangelical minister when I put the question to him, the need to bridge, even in an imperfect world. And he said, are you telling me I should bridge with the devil? And I said, well, don't start there. <laughs> but be careful who you call the devil. But start with shorter bridges. Start with something that's more doable. If you're going to get in shape, you don't get up in the morning and say, I'm going to go run 26 miles. I'm going to start by running a marathon. You might, you might say, I'm not going to start running. I'm going to start by walking. And then I'll run a block. And then maybe next week I'll run two blocks. So I like Rosenberg, and I like the idea of nonviolent communication. Judith Butler wrote a book called The Force of Nonviolence. Some people in the face of violence feel like nonviolence is non-realistic. They're asking that question in Europe right now. Can they hold on to bridging and nonviolence in the midst of a, a war where Putin is threatening nuclear proliferation? And it's a hard question, and I've been saying to my staff, we have to really grapple with that question. We live in an imperfect world, but there are things we can do. You know, Putin is not here in Rockford. So there are things we can do that doesn't require a great deal of risk, doesn't require a great deal of resources, and the things you have to do anyway. As employers, uh, as leaders in this community, what can you do to push the envelope a little bit? So I'd ask all of you to sort of embrace that and to move forward in an imperfect world. My name is Damon. I represent Colin Zero Space, and then also I'm a board member of a local nonprofit called Rockford Promise as well. The thing that I'm wrestling with is the sense of urgency that a number of people have, and it, it ranges. And as a leader, what I want to be able to do is ensure my constituents that that is where exactly we're, we're going towards. But because of everybody's level of urgency, you know, some people may feel like we're not moving there fast enough. The sense of urgency, and it's interesting, it's distributed, right? If like, if I'm comfortable, then I'm li less likely to feel the urgency. If I'm uncomfortable, then the urgency might be immediate. Again, going back to Aristotle, it's like we're situated differently. And I'm also reminded of King's statements, why we can't wait. He talked about basically during the height of the civil rights movement, many of his white allies and friends would say, yes, we can do this, but it's gonna take time. How much time? Well, maybe 100 years. Well, if you're King or if you're being locked up without food, you don't wanna wait 100 years. So part of it is really this sort of notion that different people are situated differently. And if you're relatively comfortable, your ability to wait is actually extended. There's another concept, which is that the more resources you have, the longer your time horizon. So when you're actually literally living from day to day or from paycheck to paycheck, your time horizon is very short. When you have millions of dollars or even billions of dollars, you're thinking in terms of decades or centuries. And so it's, it's interesting to sort of, how do we actually deal with this? Part of it is we have to begin to actually equalize it. The people who are worried about their electricity being turned off, help them get it turned on. Help take some of that immediacy away. 
help them know that they can survive, that they can participate, that they have the resources they need to participate. But then some people need to actually look at those longer struggles that are on the table. I worked with a group in Detroit, community groups, during the height of the bankruptcy in Detroit. And they were concerned they were going to lose their pension, lose their jobs. And, uh, and I was there to help advise them with this. And about halfway through it, I start saying to them, you know what? If we could solve the water issue, we could solve the bankruptcy issue. And they looked at me like I was from Mars. We're talking about bankruptcy. How come you're talking about water? And I said, you have a water crisis. No, we don't. I'm saying, yes, we do. And I did a terrible job. I really, I failed miserably. I wrote a memo that nobody read that said, you have a serious water problem, and it will only manifest itself in about two to five years. But it will manifest itself. But also, it's a tremendous resource that if you could actually grab this resource, it would generate billions of dollars for Detroit and the low-income community. No one paid attention to that. And these are friends. And then a few years later, Flint happened. And now I'm going to Detroit a couple of times a year, focusing not on the bankruptcy problem, but on the water problem. And I wish I had been smarter and had the sense of urgency with the bankruptcy garnered all the attention so we couldn't focus on the water. I wish I'd been smarter so I'd been able to figure out how to get people to focus on the water. Sometimes what's acute is not necessarily the most important problem, but you have to respect people. I couldn't force them to focus on the water problem. You have resources, so maybe you can use those resources so you can actually take care of some of those acute problems and then focus on the really urgent problems that may not be as acute. And the last thing I'll say is that people's interests will be distributed. Uh, so not everybody has to focus on the most urgent problem, but you can do what you can and then tell stories, invite people in who are feeling more marginal, and what do they need to be invited in? I'll end by saying this. I was working with the city of Richmond, and they were working on some housing problems and basically development problems. There's going to be a multi-billion dollar development in Richmond. It's a poor community in California. And what they asked for out of that development was $15 an hour jobs. And as a researcher and someone who cares, I said, well, maybe you could ask for a little bit more. I said, what, can we ask, what else can we ask for? $15 an hour job when I've been unemployed for three years sounds really good. I said, literally billions of dollars are coming to your community. I think you might be deserving a more than $15 an hour job. I won't tell you the whole story, but we did get to ask for more. But also, we hired a developer that was actually their developer. It was the first time in the history of that community that the community had a developer working for them. And the developer's name, Joe Ritchie, who's a friend of mine. And I was on the phone with them and Joe Ritchie trying to bring this relationship together. And these were mainly black and Latino low-income folks. And Joe Ritchie, who's white, he's those old white men that the mayor was talking about. He's one of them. So Joe is explaining to them all the stuff about development and how you do this, how you do that. And then Joe left the call. And I said, I apologize. You know, I know you didn't understand two-thirds of the things he was saying. He was talking development speak and finance, and that's not what you do. And they said, we're excited. We're fired up. We got our own developer. They didn't care that they didn't understand. <laughs> that was eight years ago. They're still working with Joe. Just having that resource of bringing something to them, someone who really works for them, they knew that he cared about them. They didn't understand all the high finance, but they knew that it was important, and they trusted him, and it caused a shift. So I think being creative in terms of how to get people to shift, a sense of urgency, maybe the most important urgency for them was not the bankruptcy, was not the water. It was being seen. It was belonging. Once they felt like they really belonged, was they really seen, and they trusted the person that they were engaged with, then I think things opened up. So I think part of it is just having those trusting relationships where people feel like they really belong, and then you can push them. You know, it's like you can push them. You can push them out of that marginality. You're thinking too small. $15 an hour wage jobs is not enough when you talk about a multi-billion dollar project. Thank you.
Well, thank you, uh, John, again, for just a really insightful and powerful message. And I think all of us uh, who chose to be here today are certainly better off uh, because of your words.